Welcome to the David Sparks Show, an ongoing exploration of issues and thought by award-winning journalist, artist, and musician David Sparks. For more info, visit the David Sparks dot com. Hello, this is Chris Christie, and I'm sad. I'm sad about things as governor, it's hard being governor, teachers always coming out to you, and that's going to buy work and the money, and this press conference, I'm, I'm just sad, I'm so sad, my chief of staff just lied to me. Of course, I didn't need to ask her any questions about what happened. She just lied. It was so blatant. Now, all the press is after me. Sad. I don't know what it's like. I wanted to. I wanted forty percent to win. That's how much I wanted to win by in the election. I only got like 25. I only won by like 25%. And I was going to show them that they made a mistake. You don't cross Chris Christie. Welcome back, folks, to the David Sparks Show. And if you have been gazing your eye upon the National Circus of news that's been going on in the past week. No one can avoid the visage or the subject of one Christopher Christie, the rotund governor of the state of New Jersey. And, well, you know, Chris was a uh, leading Republican contender and uh, could be after all of this airs out here that uh, I'm kind of thinking that Chris Christie could be the leading Republican contender for um, a felony because um, I ain't buying his story. I'm so sad. I'm so sad. I'm Chris Christie. I work hard for the taxpayers and I'm sad all my people did this to me. You ain't actually buying that load of malarkey, bull dookie docky, are you? I'm not. Here is what I gather from various reports that I've read on the Chris Christie situational circumstance. Um, a few months back, a big hub- hubbub happened. Fort Lee, New Jersey. All the cars can't get out. The bridges are closed. The people around Fort Lee are like, what's going on, dudes? They're like, it's a traffic study. And uh, anyway, this happens for four days. It ends. There's some hubbub about it. Chris Christie gets asked some questions about it and acts like, what is the big deal? This is not a conspiracy. Nothing's going on here. But... This week, the golden goose of all journalistic gifts comes from on high, often in the form of Freedom of Information Acts, requests, I should say, requested from Chris Christie's office, and boy, did they reveal a treasure trove of smoking guns. Christie's office, but not Christie himself. Oh, oh, how slick he is so far. Christie's office and his top aides, well, according to these texts, they were quite happy to shut down the bridge or the uh, highway access. I'm not exactly sure how the the thing's situation, but anyway, they, they shut down access to the highway, getting out of town, causing huge 
traffic backups and well you know what can happen in traffic backups things like emergency vehicles can't get to where they're going someone could have a heart attack in their car someone couldn't pick them up and take them to the hospital all kinds of bad stuff can happen and christy acted for months like this is nothing you don't need to be asking this the bully christy the bull in the china shop reckless with abandon but without good old fashioned logic and uh well looks like his bullying days are catching up to chris christie because uh he's throwing people under the bus because guess what the bus is coming for him don't believe for a second any word That guy said coming out of his mouth in that two-hour crybaby, I want my mama, I'm such a sorrowful victim. Proceedings that went on television last week. If this guy did not know that there was a political trick going on, which is what this whole thing was, it which endangered a lot of people, put the public's safety in danger, and it's arguable uh, whether or not it led to or is responsible for the death of a 91-year-old woman. Could have led to deaths of others. Um, if you believe for a second that he did not know that was going on you're absolutely delusional and um well you probably spend your time smelling monkey farts that's the only thing that i could explain by anyone holding the ideology that something this large um that would attract public attention was not known about. If it wasn't known about by Christie, even after it was revealed and it came to public attention, and he still didn't know, and all this went on under his nose, and what the hell was he supposedly... He's like, I'm one of the guys out there uh, directing traffic. Number one, what the hell is he out there doing directing traffic? Especially if he didn't know what was going on. Secondly, if he didn't know, he's an incompetent, incapable of governing the state of New Jersey, let alone the United States of America. Can you imagine if Chris Christie were to become president and have the ability to tap into the NSA database? He could probably pull up Images and uh, web streams from la- laptops that the NSA has equipped with malware and various other forms of spy gear. He could have like a, a treasure trove of a database of, you know, millions of Americans masturbating to pornography, um, unwittingly being filmed by the government at his hands, at his disposal. And should any of his these people be political enemies, well... I don't know how that uh, that film of you jerking off got onto uh, X Hamster or uh, U Porn or wherever else uh, the gazillion verse of porn sites that there are out there. That's why this stuff's important, folks. You can't have people, even though our government is stacked to the brim with them. You can't have people who are just really lacking integrity, um, and whose only job in politics is to win. I've heard Chris Christie say this in various speeches and talk about, you know, I've, I've actually heard him say, oh, well, you can talk about governing all you want, but if you can't win, you don't get to govern. And, you know, technically that's right. He's true there. If you don't get, if you don't win the election, you don't get to govern. Duh. But at the same time, what that's really saying is that we'll do anything that it takes to win. Because governing doesn't really matter. It's done by someone else. 
Oh, Chris Christie. Disgust me. But enough about Chris Christie. He'll get all the ink he needs and all the TV time he needs for months to come and possibly even some time in the courtroom. On to the next subject. Representative Jack Kingston, a Republican from Georgia, has warned that there's no such thing as free lunch for school children in Georgia, but he has enjoyed a few free lunches himself. An investigation by Georgia's WSAV Channel 3 found that Kingston, who is currently running for Senate and recently suggested students work cleaning cafeterias in exchange for lunch, had expensed as much as $4,182 worth of lunches for his office over the past three years. Kingston and his staff expensed nearly $4,200 in meals for business purposes to his congressional office, paid for by the American taxpayer, WSAV's Dan Cartoonin reported. WSAV also found that Kingston also racked up $4,289 of free meals paid for by third-party groups like the Georgia Bankers Association and the Congressional Institute. Kingston has also traveled to a handful of continents on congressional business, racking up $24,313 in costs. Those expenses include more than just meals. What's more, Kingston also expensed $145,391 worth of meals for campaign events. Just the $4,200 amount alone could have purchased 2,000 Georgia school lunches. Now, if you've been around an elementary school lately and checked out the school lunches, these kids aren't exactly eating high on the hog. Some chicken nuggets, maybe a little mac and cheese, some kind of semi-passable salad with mostly iceberg lettuce. Not exactly a um, something you would be looking to get on a night out eating like Jack Kingston does. But despite the effet diet and lavishing of whatever we can exp- I'm sure you know he, he, nobody was eating whoppers in Jack Kingston's campaign events and in office these are republicans you're you're dining bankers you're going to be eating you know um what's a fucking shit snails I can't think of these snails because I'm an old hillbilly. I don't eat no motherfucking snails, boy. What's them things called? Them snails when they fry them? Anyway, yeah, something like that. Something Frenchy. Yeah, Jack Kingston's not going to be eating anything except something Frenchy. And for him to get to utter the words that children should help clean the cafeteria to pay for their lunches. When this guy is jetting all over the world, eating fine meals at your expense, and has the audacity to get his big-headed ass pie hole on national TV and tell people that their kids, if they can't afford a lunch because mama works 40 hours, oh no, make that I'll change that 39 hours because they're not going to give her 40 so she can get benefits. So mama works 39 hours at Walmart and 99% of her um, money from Walmart went to rent. And the other part went to trying to keep the electricity on. There wasn't no food left over. And that kid doesn't have two bucks to, uh, to take to school the next day. Jack Kingston his little sissy ass, mamby pamby, fly around like a little welfare queen, blowing bankers and industrialists for money. I'm not sure if he actually does blow bankers and industrialists for money, but I certainly wouldn't be surprised. For him to say that a, a school child needs to clean the cafeteria. Now, don't get me wrong, I think kids need to do some stuff. They need to keep their general areas clean. They need to do chores around the house and even in the classrooms, of which I have taught in. They need things to do, chores that they have on a regular basis. It's all part of you know maintaining a structured environment. But what he's talking about and what people like Newt Gingrich are talking about 
like kids cleaning bathrooms for school lunches while we've got enough money to rain down death fire from above for any kind of brown country that says, hey, man, I think uh, we ought to keep a little bit more of our oil profits. <gasps> That's what we do to them. And these little poor kids who want uh, free lunches, there ain't no free lunch, boy, unless you're a fucking U.S. congressman. Then there's free lunches, free blowjobs, free anal waxings, free ball piercings. Because you, you know these guys are all total freaks. As, uh, they're telling us how to live, how to, you know, Jack Kingston, his, his family, traditional family morality. I wouldn't be surprised if he's having sex with monkeys and dogs. Jack Kingston, St. Bernard, Bukaki victim. Ugh. It's so fucking infuriating to hear these people. To even know that that kind of mindset exists within the soul of humans anywhere. Because then you just think, a human couldn't say that. After living high on the hog on our tax dollars. To come back and say some kid from the ghetto who's not, who doesn't have two bucks. Doesn't deserve some ham and beans. Shame on you, Jack Kingston. Shame on all you people who want to excoriate and punish poor people. Fuck you. Fuck your mama. Fuck your daddy. Because they made you. I don't know if they made you think like that. But fuck them, man. Fuck you and fuck all you all motherfuckers who ever think like that. Because we are all human beings in this universe. We are all tied together common humanity and if you think some kid needs to pay two bucks or clean the cafeteria for his lunch putting him up to shame and ridicule fuck you Jack Kingston you're the one that should be ashamed and ridiculed if you see Jack Kingston you have my express permission and encouragement well, I can't encourage people to commit violence against a U.S. congressman or a senator or anything like that. But you have my express encouragement and permission to fart in his general direction. Well, I was born to coal miner's daughter In a cabin on a hill and butcher hall we were poor, but we had love That's the one thing that daddy made sure of He shoveled coal to make a poor man's dollar And unfortunately, Appalachia is still poor and the victim of mass exploitation once again. A state of emergency has been declared in West Virginia following a spill into the Elk River of a chemical used to treat coal before it's burned called 4 Methyl cyclohexane methanol. Residents of nine counties in West Virginia have been told not to use or drink their water after a chemical use by the coal industry spilled into the Elk River on Thursday. Governor Earl Ray Tomlin declared a state of emergency as more than 100,000 customers, or 300,000 people, are without safe drinking water. The chemical is used to wash coal of impurities and spilled from a tank at Freedom Industries into the river. How ironic. Freedom Industries. Yeah, clean coal. They're going to clean the coal. And then, uh, oh, what are we going to do with the stuff we clean the coal with? Ah, that's right. There is no such thing as clean coal. You clean the coal with chemicals. And you have a big bunch of chemicals to dump somewhere or to do who knows what with or to leak into the river. You know, this has been a constant theme over the last, oh, geez, 100 years in Appalachia. And I know well because I am an Appalachian, grew up in Corbin, Kentucky, Campton, Kentucky, lived in Louisville, um, my parents live in Frankfort, Kentucky. The uh, my uh, relatives all come from down around Berea, Lancaster, Irvine, 
other places I'm probably forgetting. My mom's listening. But um, the people of Appalachia, and this just continues to this day, continue to be environmentally and economically exploited. And when you think about the mineral riches that have come out of Appalachia, that have fueled the richness and growth of the American capitalistic machine over the last century. Appalachia should be so rife with money. The schools should be, should to get whatever they want in order to do the job that they need to do. But what do we have? We have a few companies coming in, extracting the wealth, Paying coal miners, uh, they, they make pretty good money, but man, they had to fight for it. A lot of people had to die. A lot of people had to bleed in labor strikes in order for coal miners to get the living that they have today. And mostly their jobs have also been uh, gotten rid of by mechanization. And so what Appalachia is left with, well, there's no wealth from the coal industry, not widespread wealth in a societal form that makes Appalachia an attractive place to want to live, even though the, uh, as far as like natural beauty, it's one of the most beautiful places in the world. But uh, they're trying to get rid of that too. Mountaintop removal, dumping chemicals into the rivers, the lakes, and streams. From all this stuff, why? So you go out, so you people can buy iPads, keep your uh, cable television on. That is the direct expense, the direct cost of our hypercapitalistic consumer economy, poison in the rivers of Appalachia. Now we've got three hundred thousand people that don't, that can't drink water, can't shower, can't uh, brush their teeth. They've got some foreign poison toxin that's in their water supply. Go coal. What has it all brought us? Nothing. It's brought us misery and sorrow. And uh, the exploitation of Appalachia, the exploitation of the minds of Americans who think they need to live lives to pro- procure things in order to feel self worth, that ultimately is part of a system that's poisoning the planet. And here's another example. Of that, we've got 300,000 people who can't drink the water in one of the most beautiful, pristine places in the world. And how exactly are they able to get by with all this? Well, a lot of social programming. It's been going on for over 100 years. You ever notice any time you see an Appalachian in the media, how they're portrayed? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Hey, we're like, we're hillbillies. We're just so simple hillbillies from the, from the hills. We don't know that much. We're, I, my name's Honey Boo Boo. I, my, I give my kid Mountain Dew. And we're duck hunters. We're down here in the swamp. We're old rednecks. There's anything to that effect. What we're seeing with all this cultural programming, and it always seems to happen amongst areas that have a, a lot of natural resources to exploit is the the people, the image we're given of an entire swath of people, in this case, Appalachians, they're reduced to cartoon characters who, well, cartoon characters can always be exploited. They're not people. They're not humans who have to drink water every day and breathe the air every day and have a clean place and have a, a good educational system. And, uh, you know, good amenities in their cities and towns, such as parks and, you know, things that make life um, worth living, you know. But if you're able to reduce people through the media to just cartoon characters like, (laughs) I'm a hillbilly. Or, same thing we see in the uh, urban areas of our, our country. I'm a gangster. All these little cultural archetypes that we're always promoting that we want to believe about ourselves that I'm a I'm a hillbilly I'm a redneck I'm a I'm a motorcycle free road biker so all these little cultural archetypes that we believe in as as Americans little characters that we are when in reality we're mostly hairless relatives of chimps who kill for fun and profit although that's a totally different subject What I'm getting at is these things that we believe about ourselves enable us as a society 
to oppress entire populations, in this case, Appalachians. But it could be another case. We could be oppressing uh, an inner city population by having society look at those residents as mostly crime-addled gangsters, another resource for private prisons. Or perhaps we could make a stereotype of everyone in the Middle East as a turban-wearing, maniacal terrorist. Oh, wouldn't that enable us to look at those people as cartoons? That way, when we exploit their oil and rob them of their natural resources, no one will say, hey, that's a bunch of humans you're exploiting there. No, they're just cartoon characters to be exploited and manipulated at our whimsy. So when we tune in to these reality shows that essentially um, take the most eccentric, most uh, stereotypical person that we could have perpetuate a stereotype of just old simple hump country bumpkins, when we buy into that crap and say, them hillbillies sure are fun, what we're saying is that those people aren't really humans. They're a stereotype of what we've made. Because the stereotypes are crap. I'm sitting here talking to you. I was raised in Appalachia. I don't listen to banjo music. Eh, sometimes I do. But it's not like a thing for me or anything. I like music from all across the world. I like writing from all across the world. I'm a fan of British literature. I'm a fan of philosophy. I'm not just a simple little Appalachian down here. To me. <laughs> Stuff's disgusting. We're we're more than Jed Clampett. You know, we're more than a gangster rapper. We're more than a Al Qaeda terrorist. All these little images are essentially made so we can say, "Hey." portion of the population yeah, they don't really need to be humanized because they're not humanized they're savages to be exploited and colonialized and it continues today without abate it's kind of depressing but that is the state of the world here in 2014 and my time is running short so I will thank you very much, everyone, for listening to The David Sparks Show. Check me out at thedavidsparks.com. Check me out on In Your Face Radio. Check me out at TYT Nation on YouTube and uh, on Facebook at The David Sparks Show and at Twitter at David Sparks Show. Take care, y'all. Thank you for listening to The David Sparks Show, an ongoing exploration of issues and thought by award-winning journalist, artist, and musician David Sparks. For more info, visit thedavidsparks.com. 